All right. So hello, everyone. We're Jennifer Shelswell and Janice DeRoche, co-founders of Chapters for Change. And today we have Lisa DeNicolitz with us. Lisa is an international award-winning Canadian author, originally from South Africa. Lisa came to Canada in 2000 and lives and writes in Toronto. In addition to the books that she has written, her short fiction and poetry have been published in various international anthologies and journals. Welcome, Lisa. Uh, we are really looking forward to chatting with you today about your novel, The Rage Room. Um, as I read this book, I felt like I was on a roller coaster ride of emotions um, and the unsettling idea of a troubled future that might just one day be ours. So welcome so much, Lisa. Thank you very, very much. It's just such a pleasure to be here. And I'm a great admirer of your series. So thank you for having me as a guest today. Oh, thank you, Lisa. Thank you for being here. So I wanted to start off just by asking you, um, what inspired you to write this book? Initially, it was actually, I wanted to write a book to thank my mum for all the stuff she did when I was a child. It was supposed to be this feel good memoir thing. Well, not memoir thing, but, you know, drawing on the happy memories of my childhood. And then, of course, it went completely into something um, admittedly quite, you know, violent, in, you know, in, in ways brutal and it com something completely different. It, it popped out to something else. So, um. A lot of times I feel like we don't choose our creative voices and we don't choose the messages that we write. The, the book wanted to be written. And so I'm I'm largely for my books a conduit. And many people, like if you look at John Lennon, you know, I've been looking at the, the series Get Back. And even when he is singing help with this level of absolute desperation, I, I, the message is so deep, but it's this cheery ditty. Um, and so it comes, it, you know, it sounds so cheerful, yet it's just really, and a lot of my tone um, and the way I write, it's, it's noir, it's quite dark. And I, I kind of wish I had, I know it to a certain degree, my family wishes that I wrote sort of chiclet and shopaholic books, but <laughs> that's not what I do. So you can't really choose your creative voice, which is good and bad. Excellent. So that's really interesting that, um, you know, when, when you started writing the book, you, you kind of had this vision of what it would be, and then it kind of took its own path and maneuvered around with, with its, its ideas there. So that's really, really interesting. Um, what inspired you? So within the book, like obviously with the title as well, The Rage Room, what um, inspired you to incorporate the idea of Rage Rooms into the book? I've been seeing a lot of anger in the world um, and a lot of social media um, anger, people posting nasty comments that they wouldn't do um, in, in person. Like it just felt like our world was moving towards this increasingly virtual, increasingly angry um, state. And then a colleague of mine at work mentioned that um, a friend of hers was going through a divorce. And so she was taking her friend to a rage room. And I was like, rage room <laughs> and so it just it seemed so perfect I had to find a way to work in uh, the rage room and then for some reason um you know it became a question of what if you committed the worst act you possibly could which as we know is what Sharps does in the book but then you regret it terribly and you you had the chance to fix it and that's why I ventured into time travel time travel now I hate time travel. <laughs> I don't read it. I don't enjoy it. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I certainly don't enjoy writing it. I'm just going to have a little sip of my stuff here. So, so why time travel? Because mm, it had to be. It was the way for him to be able to ask himself, would he do something different if he could? <clears throat> so I gave him all these different opportunities to change his behavior. And you know from, from the books, that shops is shops. And that's another interesting thing. You know, are we inherently bad people or good people? And how much can we change the perhaps morality that we were born with? So these were all questions that, you know, <clears throat> came into the book. And so um, but writing time travel has never been something I wanted to do. <laughs> it was horrible. 
I can imagine that that would have been very difficult. It's not an easy feat, right? I had read somewhere that you um, had done a lot of research around time travel as well in order to be able to um, effectively write the book because um, there were a lot of things to consider in that. So, but I think you did it very successfully, Lisa. Thank you very much. And I also had a really good beta reader who's a, a time travel um, aficionado. And so I would send him things and he'd say, no, that doesn't work because, and then I'd have to go back and rewrite it. So yeah. it, was a, it was a tough one. Yeah. I'm just going to touch on another question yeah. here related to, um, because you've been talking a lot about how your writing tends to be dark and one thing that we see um in the rage room is a lot of characters who come with uh, extreme flaws and we learn a lot of these flaws as we're reading yes. um did you use the language the content um so we see some murder and abuse as well um yes. were you using this as a way to send a specific message about the world and were you hoping to evoke certain emotions in your readers most definitely and I I know that you know it's, it's sometimes you know with the book it's like it's quite sort of in your face and it makes me think of the first time I tried to watch Deadpool and I was deeply offended by Deadpool I said to my husband like I can't watch this this is deeply offensive and then I came back to it in a different mood and I really enjoyed it and so I feel like sometimes I'm like the Ryan Reynolds of Can Litton's social conscience. Like I, I'm trying to say these things, um, but I say them in quite a dark way. And yes, the characters are really very flawed. Some people find some of the characters quite funny and some people find parts of the book quite funny. And I never write, I never try to write humor. I don't think one can. And particularly with regard to these things, I mean, it's it's not funny, the things that he does, but certain aspects of what happened in the book, um, you know, they, they're sort of instances of light relief, but deeply flawed people. But, but the thing is, I feel like so many people in life are flawed. I feel like I'm not the person, people always say to me, you're such a sweet and happy person and yet you write this dark stuff. Because honestly, I see the world in a dark way. I don't, I don't think there's a lot of good out there. I feel like we have to seek it out and actively work at it. And I think that, you know, writing a book like that is almost trying to point people in a direction and say, look, this is what's going on out there. Let's try and stop that. Let's try not to be that way. So, you know, it's a vehicle for a message, I think, I hope. Thanks, Lisa. So maybe now we could touch on some of, because we advocate chapters for change to really um, get people to act and, and change. Yes. And one of the things I really love about your book is the fact that it touches on so many social justice issues and world issues. Yeah. And there are a lot of dark issues in the world right now. I think we've seen a lot of that come out of even... Um, COVID and a lot of actions that have been taken and um, yeah so if you could t talk a little bit about some of those social justice issues that you decided to address in your book and why those specific issues were so important to you. I think the disconnect the incongruency between um, our real selves and our social media selves is something that deeply disturbs me and it's increasingly getting that way. And I know that like, um, you know, the beginning of the pandemic, my little niece joined TikTok and she was doing all these sweet little dances and stuff. And it really worried me because I thought, you know, who who is watching this stuff? And then, you know, she was getting affected by how many people liked her posts and how many people were following her. And it was, and I just thought this is such a negative way for her to be growing up. It's such a negative world for her to be growing up in. And so I also, the books that I write, I always hope that my niece and nephew will go back and read them and that it'll help them navigate through their lives. And maybe they'll be like, hey, you know, until he wrote this and I shouldn't worry about that. So I'm not going to. So I hope that. And I really feel like because of social media and also as well because of COVID, I, I do largely, I'm going to say blame social media. 
our sense of self is disintegrating it much in the same way as like pixels disintegrate on a screen. And even things like, um, you know, religious holidays and traditions and things like this, I feel like we're losing our spirituality. And that makes me very sad. I have always tried very hard to be a spiritual person. And I was brought up Catholic and a fervent Catholic. I was a committed Catholic. But the things that the Catholic Church have done over the past few decades and the, the things that they have not addressed or owned up to have really eroded my faith. And that's why in the book, there is that episode that is centered around abuse and the church. And I, de I deliberately almost parodied the way the church, you know, Jesus becomes Chris Hemsworth in neon on a cross because that's what religion and spirituality is turning into. And, and I, I mourn that, that we've got Christmas coming up and Christmas always used to mean two things to me. It used to mean a spiritual season. And really, I don't care what day Jesus was born or if Jesus was even Jesus. And I hope people won't even get upset by me saying that because I don't think it, those specific matters, it's the celebration of the spiritual and the celebration of the family and I feel like in the world we live in right now those two things are being eroded and that's why as well you know the pivotal event in the rage room happened on Christmas Eve and that was important to me too because it used to be my favorite night of the year we'd as Hungarians have Christmas on Christmas Eve with my nudge mama and we'd, my Hungarian grandmother and it was the best night we would stand there and they would play Stiele Nacht in German and she would ring a little bell and it was a perfect moment. And now where is that moment? And so that's why I wanted to say, well, what's the worst thing that could happen on Christmas Eve? And that's what Sharps did. <laughs> he did the worst possible thing. Yeah, Christmas has always been really important to our family as well. And specifically Christmas Eve was a time where we would get together with the whole family as well to really celebrate. So I can see too where, it, you know, it it is finding like a, a balance between um, honoring different communities within society, but also holding on to um, culture that has been important and, and still celebrating that so that we're able to you know, hold on to some things as well within our own, um, you know, ch childhood memories and building memories with our, our own children and, and, um, and that. And you had touched on, and I love that from the book as well, where um, it was obvious to be, but maybe some readers wouldn't have picked up on it um, too, where it was a comment on the abuses that have happened within the Catholic Church. Um, we see a lot happening, finally, with more understanding and a want for learning to occur um, in order to work toward reconciliation with Indigenous uh, communities and uh, holding the church and society responsible for what has happened. Um, if you could talk just a little bit about the ways in which your book could be seen as a call to action. Well, I'm hoping as well that people will be more aware of the use of plastic because, you know, we are killing the world with plastic. And, you know, I, I feel so powerless to do anything about it because it's big corporation um, and, you know, even, for example, I mean, I'm a person who admittedly loves beauty and beauty products, uh, but I've stopped buying them because the packaging that they come in is absolutely disgusting. Like, yeah, and children's toys as well. Like, you will open up toys and it's, you know, you, you end up with this tiny little thing and you, you, two kilograms of plastic has been created. And, you know, meanwhile, we're trying not to use, you know, plastic bags to go to the grocery store, but it's so much bigger than that. And so, you know, I really wanted people to be a world of what would uh, be aware of what would happen if the world became plastic. And to me, 
<clears throat> that's not an unrealistic thing. We seem to be going, and we're getting so disconnected from nature. And yes, Janice, I really agree with you. It's something that I do like about the world, because I don't just want to sound like I'm hitting the world, is the sort of diversity of spirituality where we are we are moving forward. Yes, the you know Catholicism has let us down, but I, you know, moving towards you know learning religions and respecting other cultures. And I I read, in fact, I wanted to recommend um, a book to you guys. It's by Carol's Golden Eagle um, of Inanna Publications, and I think you would also like it because she writes it from the point of view of the mother. It's a collection of poetry and the children have grown up and she she wrote these poems when they were young. So and it has these indigenous recipes, which are so fantastic. And to me, it was actually made me feel better about the upcoming Christmas season because it reminded me of the deeper spirituality as we're linked to the creator. And I've always felt like um, I always felt like the creator um, you know, the, the indigenous leaders of the land and the ancestors for some reason wanted me to be here. I didn't feel welcome in Australia, but I feel like the indigenous leaders were say, said to me, like, hey, welcome. Ah, I know that sounds, it sounds really self-aggrandizing. Like, why would they care about me? They don't. But the thing is, I feel like I feel welcome in Canada by, you know, the indigenous spirits. And I feel like it's really wonderful that we're trying to, but there's a long way to go. And I'm really angry with the Pope for not, you know, addressing the situation of the residential schools and you know the whole residential schools just make me want to weep so um so yeah it is it is but at least we are you know trying to to become you know more aware of things and learn more and and you know forums like your platform here are helping people so oh thank you so much lisa that's what the hope is and and you know Jen and I also feel, you know, as as Canadians and settlers to the land, it's it's our job to to educate ourselves. Like that's really where it started was um, educating ourselves, reading as much as we could, and then trying to reach a wider audience and, and hoping that through promoting books like yours that touch on social justice issues, that it will help help in the education of all. And really that is the key, right? Um, you know, um, in order to, to learn, to change, we need to first educate ourselves to, to move forward. And what do you hope from reading, I'm just gonna hold up your book again. I know you have such a large one. I love it in the background there. <laughs> but what are you hoping that readers will take away from the rage room? To be, to be less angry. Um... And it's a difficult thing because, you know, anger, anger comes from fear. And I know that about myself when I, you know, I've, I'm a person who's always had a quick temper. I'm a person who has always been really impatient um, as a child. These are difficult aspects of my personality. And I think that's also why I wanted to write The Rage Room because it's also something where, um, you know, it's difficult to admit I, I can be an angry person and, it's not something one wants to admit about oneself because it's 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 not a nice thing, right? But I am a person who is quick to anger. I would like to be a person who is not quick to anger. And so for me personally, the main takeaway of the book is to try and be, you know, less of an ang angry person. I think I was I was you know born an angry little person and I think you know I also couldn't sleep when I was a child so I don't know you know there's always things there's when when is born with baggage right you're born with your own baggage got nothing to do with your parents or even your environment you pop out into this world your own little tormented self and then have to try and deal with it along the way and sometimes it's not as easy as others and writing the books helps me and I hope will help others and that's why I each book has touched on a different topic because I hope that maybe maybe this book may not reach out to a person, but another book might with with the topic that it, that it covers. I think even touching on that theme of of anger, it really does relate to I think the point that you're trying to make through the book, 
And I know some readers um, have, have felt like enraged by some of the topics after reading, but I think what maybe some people fail to realize is that that's exactly how they should feel when they're, they're reading about these disturbing issues. Yes, exactly. And in fact, I'm watching another thing. I made some notes here. I'm watching something on Netflix called Voir, V-O-I-R. And it's this great series about movies. And I'm going to quote here from Drew McWeeny, um, who was talking about revenge movies. And he was saying, storytelling doesn't start with they lived happily ever after. Art isn't just about hanging out with your friends on the couch. Art is where we confront things that terrify or upset or traumatize us. And he said, it's crucial that we tell stories about characters we don't like. And I thought, yeah, that's so true. And that kind of made me feel better <laughs> about my somewhat obnoxious character. However, I will say this. I'm currently working on a sequel to The Rage Room. It's called Everything You Dream Is Real. I'm quite excited about it. And actually, Our Man Sharps shows some redemption. And the sequel is a completely different book. The, the sequel is about falling in love a multi-generational story. So there's a lot of romance, um, you know, not, not sort of Harlequin romance, but um, it's a, it's about friendship and family and community. So it is a sequel and Sharps does reappear, but it's, it's a much, it's a much lighter book and I'm really enjoying writing it for that reason. I'm having a lot of fun with it. And I'm trying Absolutely. to think is yes. And other, another thing that uh, that person uh, the, was made by Tony Zhao on that thing is, you know, why did institutions fail to punish perpetrators? And what happens if we take matters into our own hands? So that's a question that the Rage Room asked as well. And then um, Jennifer Yu Nelson said, in real life, violence happens for no reason, no good reason to good people, and it's never resolved. There's so many small and large injustices, instances of injustice, and there's a lack of satisfaction and the injustice upsets people. And that was also why I wrote the book, because I wanted to say, yes, injustice happens. Yes, in the rage room, it isn't an exaggerated form and it is, it is within the context of speculative fiction. But I wanted to show that like there is resolution and that's why the ending has the somewhat uncomfortable ending that it does because there had to be um you know there had to be vindication for the good people in the book awesome thank you so much lisa we're just going to ask you um one more question here um because i think we have time for that what does change mean to you Ah, yes, I love that question. And I made some notes here because awesome. <laughs> I, I commit nothing to memory. My memory is completely useless. <laughs> um, <laughs> change to me is incremental adjustments of the self. Um, so I mentioned my impatience. And uh, on the one hand, it's good because I get a lot done because I'm an impatient person. But on the other hand, it makes me difficult to be around. So change is not so much as changing oneself but as changing one's behavior so that they don't negatively affect other people. Um, change is acceptance of the self. And that is for me, one of the hardest things. I, I struggle to accept myself. I work daily to try and accept myself, um, you know, the, the, the prickly aspects of myself and the, the aspects that drive myself mad. So change to me is a very incremental and, and difficult thing. It's not a broad sweeping, you know, often I'll say I'm going to wake up and, you know, be like this. And of course, that's completely impossible. Thank you so much, Lisa. I think we can all relate to that. And we really, really appreciate you meeting with us today to talk about the Rage Room. And we are very excited to hear that there will be a sequel and we'll be definitely checking that out as well. Thank you very, very much. And thank you for all your support and a massive shout out to Jennifer for a lovely artwork on Rotten Peaches. It is still my favorite cover. I love it. Every time I see the characters, because that's one of my favorite books. And again, a, a, you know, a book about obsessive love. And it just, I, I see those people on the cover and I get happy. So thank you very much for that awesome cover. It's 
totally my favorite. So thank oh, you. Thank you so much, Lisa. And I'll just do a quick little um, zoom in of the cover here for those that can uh, see it on the screen. So yes, thank you so much. Um, it's been a pleasure chatting with you today. Uh, and um, yeah, look forward to your upcoming sequel to, to The Rage Room. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for having me as a guest today. Thank you. And carry on with this marvelous initiative. Oh, thanks, Lisa. We will. If you don't want to miss any of our upcoming videos, make sure that you hit the subscribe button below as well as the notifications. And you can also visit our website, chaptersforchange.com for educational resources and to see what we're up to. See you soon.